<laughs> Hi, Stefan. So great to see you. <laughs> Hi, Marcus. It's great to see you too. Hey, are, are you at home today? At home. It's a holiday here. It's in Germany too, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So. Um, I completely forgot. I completely forgot forgot about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's no special day for us either. It's just a day at home. I mean, every day at home is a special day, but uh, <laughs> otherwise, it's it's just a free day. Are our schools currently closed in Switzerland? I mean, today they are because of the holiday, but not generally. No, no. Okay. They, um, they wear masks, and uh, but it's normal, normal school curriculum. Okay, so because like um, you know you you are working as a uh, as a teacher, so that's why that was my first question. I'd like to see if you uh, actually, um, you know, like a lot of people here, a lot of teachers and a lot of uh, parents have to teach their children from home. And uh, yeah. I did that too for a while, mm -hmm. but um, since March I've been teaching normally again. Very good. Very good. So what, what are you teaching, actually? Uh, math, mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> surprise, surprise. <huh? laughs> yeah, it's, it's sort of always been my two favorite subjects in school, math and music. Mm -hmm. And um, it was funny that when I started uh, studying at the University of Zurich, there were like 100 people in our class. And we made a count once and like it was 95 of them were, were musicians. I mean, <laughs> really active musicians, not just, you know, hobby or so, but it's amazing. It's amazing how many people who like math also like music. Of course, it's not the other way around. <laughs> if you ask musicians about math, you usually get a very bad answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think for me, there's also a strong, strong relationship somehow. Just yeah. uh, maybe, maybe, um, Kind of like very more on a more superficial level, let's say, where it's about the uh, the joy of discovering um, new things. Somehow, you know, that's that's. I think that's what it is for me. But I I I also uh, you know like in my abitur I had uh, mathematics as well. You know, as a <laughs> yeah, it's like a, a confined world where you can you you operate with certain um, in math with numbers and, and structures etc and music with with notes etc but it's like an old an own world that you can create and that's, mm -hmm. that's what i like to do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to step out of the, uh, the normal reality and just go someplace where where nobody's been before yes yes hey because like i hardly get a chance to talk to you about about your um yeah your, te your you know your teaching job so i'm i'm interested like um is the, how has your um you know if you do something for a long time right and you have been you have been a teacher for for quite a while so so how has your skill say in in teaching mathematics has that changed at all can you see was there any development in that field for you well, I mean, the development has been that um, teaching is totally different today than it was 30 years ago. I mean, 30 years ago, there were no computers and you did it all, you know, in the old school way. And um, today, a lot of it is done, you know, with, uh, with online stuff and computers and notebooks and calculators and, and uh, all these things that make, make teaching completely different now, really. Mm -hmm. And... I'm, I'm sort of somebody, I still like, you know, the way math was done 100 years ago, just using a pen and, and a piece of paper. I still love that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's been a little bit difficult for me to, to get used to these new type of teaching where you do everything with the computer and show, uh, show, show graphs and, and all this stuff instead of, you know, just stepping back and thinking about it and trying to, to get your ideas on a piece of paper or on, mm -hmm. the, on the blackboard. Mm -hmm. I still I still enjoy that working at the blackboard, but um, a lot of people, you know, a lot of new teachers, new math teachers, they hardly do that anymore. It's all uh, computerized and handouts. And I mean, no no handouts. They just it's all all electronic PDFs and stuff. Yeah, I can't can, can imagine that. Hardly, hardly write anymore. 
I mean, mm. that's something that I also strongly believe that you should you should write things. You should write a lot. And if you if you never write, if you just I mean, you can't read a math book like like it's some kind of a suspense story. It's it's just math. You have to do it. You have to take a pen and take a piece of paper and write it down. Otherwise, you'll never get it. So mm -hmm. um, that's been a little bit, you know, the, the challenge for me to to cope with these changes that have been going on. Yeah, I can totally uh, understand. You know, I, I left school and um, my last year was in uh, 92. So uh, 30, almost 30 years. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I have to tell you, I um, because I'm, I'm left handed. Right. And my my writing was always very weak because I didn't have teachers that supported me in learning to learning to write. So I, uh, I always had a a problem with that somehow like also even even emotionally from the experience i made even in the in the uh, Bundschule in germany you know and then um uh, after you know after the abitur I, I i i kind of like even though i went to start a study you know psychology i hardly ever used a pen anymore and 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 then started typing you know on the, uh, on the computer the, keyboard <laughs> why why do you play the guitar on the right with, the, with your right hand and this way yeah i was i was thinking about that i just uh, i just actually just a few hours ago i spoke to that with my massage therapist because he was saying like that uh, he was thinking that my left foot was my uh um i don't know how you call that in english but the, the primary uh foot that i stand on right so on leg that i stand on would be the left and i said to him well but i'm, I'm left-handed and then we started talking and then i i realized like because he he mentioned a few things that you kind of like do in every life, and I realized I'm actually I think I am um, quite capable of doing almost everything with both hands. Okay. So That's it's cool. it's the writing. So I would I would still I would still say I'm 100% left-handed, you know, like in a way. But but the circumstances sort of have led me to to just use both sides um, relatively equally. And then with the guitar, I guess it was just. You know, before the guitar, it was a mandolin for me okay. when I was maybe eight or nine years old. And and the mandolin, I mean, I don't think anybody ever asked, right? <laughs> like, and the mandolin, it was this way, and I started playing it this way, so then you know, right-handed way. <laughs> and it's, it's funny because I um, actually I asked uh, Robert Fripp about this also because he's also left in it and plays right-handed and and he also said to me like he can't really say much about it because he's never tried the other way around and it's sort of like the same for me yeah. okay yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> i guess that's a lot different today i mean today there's so many left-handed players so that a young person would, would think oh maybe maybe it's easier for me that way but you're right in that like 30 40 years ago that wasn't really something that was uh... i mean you had Jimi hendrix of course who uh, who played? Um, what did he, he played on the wrong side? You know the guitar on the wrong side. So maybe that yeah. was maybe for some people an, an influence. But um, I think it's very much about how you how you first get exposed to an instrument somehow. You know, I think that's what. But I don't know. I, I really don't know. I can can tell you, but. Um, yeah. So um, so just a little bit. Better, you know, back to the to your teaching. Um, because I'm, as you know, like, and both you and I were kind of like also interested in like long term processes, right? Like as as artists, and and since mathematics to me, mathematics themselves are also some sort of art, um, from my from my perspective. And if if you, you because you're because of your 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 profession, you are kind of like exposed to it. You kind of like have to do it every day, right? Almost every day. And and so that's why I'm I'm wondering how this 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 uh, maybe a little bit imposed discipline that you uh, have had with mathematics how that sort of like if there's like anything in your appreciation or even like I said like in the way that you actually deal with the and I don't mean the numbers but the the kind of thinking the problem solving if and how you can see any way that that has evolved or changed over time well 
I mean, what I do in my day job is, is teaching math. So I'm not really doing the kind of math that I would consider creative. Like when I was in the university, that, that was the time I was really, you know, math, math is really about finding proofs of something. You know, you, 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 you look at something, look, look at a theory, you, you suspect something could be true, and then you try to prove it. And mm -hmm. by trying to prove it, you, you have to dig so deep down. And, and it's, also, it's a process of, of looking for something, finding, thinking you, you found it, but then realizing there's, it's more complex than you thought. So you have to dig deeper and deeper and deeper. And mm -hmm. that's, that's really the interesting, creative, artistic part of math, I think, mm -hmm. finding, finding a, a proof for, um, for something interesting. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's not really things that I do anymore. I mean, very seldomly, I, I think about, you know, new kind of proofs, the, the proofs that I teach at school, I know them all by heart by now. And it's just uh, yeah. it's nothing really new for me. But um, that those few years that I, I was writing my, my thesis, um, those were really interesting, because um, I learned how to dig deep into something, you know, mm -hmm. not just doing something and being content with it in an early stage, but really going one step deeper and then another step deeper. And so that's, that's something that I really learned from math. Yeah, yeah. You know, for me, I think, and I think I now know, understand better what I was asking. <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of, for, for me, it's, it's uh, maybe about the, um, really about the teaching, what I take from it. Like if I have like my uh, 50th uh, uh, touch guitar student, right? Like, for example, and I, I explained, so it really like, even though I may, I may, uh, explain the same thing over and over again, but the fact that I'm dealing with a different human being with a different history and different abilities, I sort of like learn, I, I learned so much about even teaching the same thing over and over again. And that is sort of like a, a big plus, like for me on top of, um, uh, on top of being a musician myself, that I also get to kind of like learn, as you say, like to go very deep, even by, by repeating the same thing over and over again. And, and, you know, the repetition is something that both you and I kind of also uh, are very fond of in a musical context. <laughs> so. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, you said that you were obviously uh, already a musician when you started going to university. So when is your, uh, how was your introduction to music, like very early on? Like, what's the first thing you can remember? Um, that's what Sid asked me when he wrote uh, the liner notes for the first Sonar album. He asked me what were my first musical impressions. And I really remember clearly that my first musical experience was at the beach. We had, I was living in California and there's um, a beach called Bodega Bay. And we went there every Sunday or Saturday. And I just sat for hours just listening to the seagulls and the waves and the and waves hitting the rocks. And I clearly remember that as music, you know, not just as sounds, but as something that really felt like music to me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's um, that's a, that was a very first, a very important first impression for me to, for music. Incredible. And then, yeah. And then, um, well, I learned a lot of music basically by my. My, my sister was listening to uh, the Beatles, so I, I listened to a lot of Beatles when I was young. And then my cousin was very important. I, we, I, I, I left America when I was 10, and we went to Germany. I lived in Frankfurt for uh, half a year. And my cousin there, he, he introduced me to Prague. He was a big uh, Emerson Lake Power fan, and uh, also King Crimson, actually. He, I remember clearly I was at, um, in Frankfurt, and he said, Oh, there's a King Crimson concert at the Zoom Club. That was 1972, I think. And I said, oh, let's go. And then he said, oh, no, they're not good anymore. King Crimson, the first album was great, but they're not good anymore. <laughs> and I really regret that I didn't go. <laughs> I was very young, but still, I'm certain it would have made an impression. <laughs> and, um, so he didn't like the later Crimson, but I did. And um, but first, maybe first thing, yeah, I think, um, the first album I really, really loved was um, Yes Songs, you know, the triple live album. Yeah. I really loved that. And uh, I listened to it thousands of times. And 
could play almost every part on that record from you know Steve Howe. He's, he, I, I really love the way he was playing. Mm -hmm. But then I discovered the the new Crimson, the seventy three King Crimson, and that really blew my mind. I know I I, I was at the record shop once, and then there was Starless and Bible Black, you know, the album coming out, and I I, I went to the to the guy on, and, and who was serving, and he said. Um, I asked him if I could listen to the record. And he accidentally, it was an LP, so he accidentally put on the second side, which is a really, you know, way out improvisation. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and I was like, wow, what is this? I mean, that completely rearranged my mind, these two mm -hmm. pieces. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really the fundament, I think. And then, of course, I, I, I read a lot about uh, Robert Fripp, and he talked about Bella Bartok you know, and this kind of music, the string quartets. So I listened to them too. And that was what sort of my musical path. But, so you must have been really, really young, right? Like 12, something yeah, like that, or 13. Yeah. 13. Yeah. Oh, incredible. Yeah. yeah, that's really incredible. So what was the first live uh, rock concert you saw? Do you remember that? First live gig? Mm -hmm. It may have been... I'm pretty sure it was um, at the Hallenstadion in Zurich, you know, the big stadium. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if it was Pink Floyd or Emerson Lake Palmer or something, something like that. I'm not quite sure. I also saw Robin Trower opening for one of those acts. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't remember which one, but I, I remember really that that impressed me and um, the way the music that was, the, they played. That was the first band he had, I think. You know, mm -hmm. the Bridge of Eyes, I think. Was, mm -hmm. Really, really lovely record. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's very interesting, Stefan, because I um, uh, I never I never thought about this, but it's really uh, <laughs> it's really uh, kind of obvious in a way like yeah. this. The, but uh, yeah, I just I just have never thought about it this way that you had that that young uh, uh, at that young age this this really strong experience with discovering the music that sort of has then uh, kind of like shaped the the course of your musical life and uh, yeah 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 fantastic yeah. fantastic yeah so I mean, uh you know, yeah. that it was a problem for me too because um you know i really i i loved fripp's music so much that i i and i i learned to play everything and and it was like i couldn't get away from his influence that that was a problem for a long time mm -hmm. you know that i just I just sounded like him and, and everybody said, well, it sounds nice, but it's not, you know, we've heard it before, uh, think of something new. So mm -hmm. it took me a very long time to, you know, to, to free myself from this influence. And mm -hmm. it was tough, it's, it's not, it's not, and I mean, obviously you can still hear it now, but um, it's maybe- Yeah, uh, but much, 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 much less so, I would say though, I think it's uh, its, its own thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, but I really, I really like those. I mean, generally, the the, the early '70s were 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 really incredible musical wise. There's so much going on. Also, Steve Reich, you know, the music for 18 musicians that was also very important for me, and uh, a, a lot of stuff from the early '70s really uh, got into me. Made made me want to be a musician, mm -hmm. but. Um, but uh, I remember <laughs> I was talking to my father when I finished school. Um, I went to my I visited my parents. They were back in America again, so I, I went back to America, to California. I visited my parents, and my father asked me what I wanted to do, and I said I want to be a musician. Mm -hmm. And then he said, "No way! You're gonna you're gonna starve as a musician. I'm not going to support that." And I was. Like, Okay, my, my mother said, well, you should, he, he has to do music, you see, it's his passion, let him do music. But my father was totally, you know, uh, against it and, and really told me that he wouldn't support me and he meant it, he, he wouldn't have done mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of like, hmm, shall I try it anyway or not? But I probably was much too uh, dutiful son to to not do what he told me to do he, he said i should i should study physics he, he was a, f a physicist and um or math or something like that and well of course math i liked so i said well i could study math and just do music on the side mm -hmm. and that's actually what i did mm -hmm. 
<laughs> did you have did you have uh, uh did your parents take you to music school or something yeah they were supportive they um they sent me to piano lessons when i was like six or seven mm -hmm. and um but i I tried a lot of instruments. I, I played the piano for a year, then I played violin for a year, then I play, even played um, trumpet for a year, mm -hmm. and sort of like was searching for my instrument. And then, then a friend of mine had an older brother. He was guitar. He was a guitarist, and I saw him play, and I knew that's my instrument. <laughs> I had to play guitar. <laughs> so, then switched to guitar, and uh, yeah, that was when I was I was around. Same age when I when I um, listened to King Crimson for the first time, so seventy three or something like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that you know, like you probably went to university when you're like nineteen or twenty years old or something like that. Yes, twenty. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So so up to that point, then um, was the the guitar was sort of like something that you were kind of like studying already, or was it just like something that you kind of like you said you used it to play. Uh, Steve Howe's parts, and you learned right. uh, Fripp, or, or did you, or did you have like a, a a good teacher back then, already? I did have a teacher. He was a classical teacher. I went. I had classical guitar lessons for a while, and um, that's why my I have problems with my back because I was like you know playing like this all the time, mm -hmm. and um, so. I had classical lessons for a while and played a lot of stuff, which I enjoyed. Um, you know, Benjamin Britten, Nocturnal and stuff like that. I really loved that music, but somehow I just didn't feel that the acoustic guitar was the right guitar for me. It had to mm -hmm. be electric. So, mm -hmm. um, so my father bought me a, a black Stratocaster. That was my first guitar. And um, yeah, I played you know, played in in student bands and stuff like that, school bands and, and all sorts of things. And eventually we had a band, um, I mean, wasn't wasn't great, but it, it was sort of like, okay, I thought this this is going in a good direction. And that that was that was just right after I started studying. So that was like it took me a few years until I got to the point where I found this this is really uh, going in a good way now. And uh, that band was already playing your compositions? Partly, yeah, partly. I mean, it was like I would, I would write two or three pieces and um, the keyboard player would write two or three pieces, more in that style. Okay. And so what was, can you remember like the first attempt at, compo at composing that you did? Do you remember what, what that was? I remember the first piece that I thought this is a good piece. Yeah, this is a this is this is worth something, and um, that was. But that I mean that was so so obviously, you know, discipline, the record discipline um, wow. influenced. So it was this kind of arpeggio with the guitars and fast fast runs and and uh, you know, drumming uh, with the together with the guitar in unison and so on. So it was, I mean, very obviously influenced by that. Mm -hmm. Interesting, because I, I just remembered in my in my youth, I also, uh, as I said, I played mandolin, and then um, in, on my fifteenth uh, birthday, I had my first classical guitar lesson. So, and then I, so I had already been in the guitar orchestra with uh, with the mandolin, but then I started playing guitar in the guitar orchestra, and then the, one of the first pieces I wrote was uh, was for the guitar orchestra. I just I just remember that. Okay. Yeah. How many guitars? I think we're like maybe fourteen or fifteen. It was it was big, like yeah. it was it was it was good. <laughs> yeah, good. You know, but because I'm just let's just trying to remember because for me the basically the composing part um, started before I was in any band mm -hmm. somehow. Yeah, you told me that once. I remember. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then I, when I joined the band at um, around like maybe 18, 19 years old, um, I didn't really contribute much to the writing in that group. Yeah. yeah. No, I think, I mean, now, I mean, I'm, I, I was, I got 62 yesterday. So it took me a really, really, really long time to find out that 
composing is actually that what I, I would like to do in life. That's like my, my vocation, I think. And it took me a long time to find that out because, I mean, I, obviously I love to play music, but I didn't really know that, I mean, today I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a decent guitarist, but um, it's just some things that I find other people can do better than I can, can do. So like in, if you listen to fractal guitar, I'm really happy to have somebody play on this because Mm -hmm. I mean, David Thorne, he can do it a lot better than I can. So I'll let him do it. And that's, and that's, I mean, some people say, well, why do you do a solo album and ask other people to play guitar? It's because I don't really feel I'm a guitarist first. You know, I'm, I feel more that I'm a composer first now. But it took me a while to realize that. Yeah, so. interesting. Because, because like that, that is really something we have in common. I also... Um, the playing was always secondary to me right. somehow right. and and only only because sort of you know by necessity um, right. I, I became a player and performer myself but it, it, for me it was more about the research just you know play something try, trying to find something that sounds cool and and the compo composing with yeah. the instrument yeah, right? the, yeah doing the research and and i also remember um when i was also a kid uh, like eight or so my father said he'll he'll give me um, a camera and so we went to the shop and then um, I was asked yeah what kind of pictures do you want to take and I remember I said I'd like to compose a picture so it's not like you know snapshot there snapshot here it's really like okay I want this there that one, okay and then I'll take the picture so it was like already then I had this idea that I like to arrange things in a certain way that I like them and uh, I think that's also very telling for me that, that I mean, all the things that you, you wanted to do as a kid, there's something that's more, it has an importance, I think, to, to who you really are and what you should or what you can do in life. So I was, I was like, <laughs> kind of happy to find that out, to remember that. <laughs> that's a great, great story, you know, because it's a different medium, right? But, but it's the same interest and uh, the arrangement of things. Yeah. 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 Composing. Yeah. Composing. Exactly. Composing is, is, is really, um, yeah. You know, like this, this idea that, um, that as a composer, you can basically create a new world. Like it's just like within itself. It's just it's just this this new world, and uh, I think that's really also what has always fascinated me. Yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah. Being yeah. able to create and and that again, that's a mathematician has that too. I mean, if you if you define some rules, then these rules will create a new world. It's very it's it's funny, but it's 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 interesting to experience that and. For instance, I don't know if you know, for instance, about complex numbers, you know, imaginary I numbers. Yeah. I mean, these are so interesting because you can create a world that does obviously doesn't exist. I mean, you there's no in the real world, there's nothing like a complex number, but it's a, such a fascinating world where where many things are much simpler and, and more elegant than in the real world. Mm. And you can solve problems really easily that you I mean, it's it's you, it's really hard to solve them in the real world, so to speak. Mm -hmm. In the complex world, it's 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 totally easy and totally elegant, and and you know, things uh, experiencing things like this, I think, are are very interesting. Even I mean, even for a musician, just to see that that you can also create worlds not necessarily just with sounds. Yeah, for sure, for sure, exactly. You know, and, and it has a lot to do for me, a lot, you, it's funny with imagination, right? Like you say, imaginary numbers, but it's, it's the yeah. imagination that is kind of present in the music as much as in something made up in mathematics, right? Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, you know, I like, I love the idea of permutation and in a way, uh, imaginary numbers are a permutation of the real numbers. If just, you know, like if you know what I mean, it's just like uh, it's it's an additional it's it's, it's you, an you additional can, dimension, right? It's yeah, it's an additional dimension, exactly, yeah. exactly. So you, it's basically like you rotate something into the other into another dimension, and um, and with music, I I've, 
I have this this same uh, it obviously different but same idea that I want to take something and then I ask myself the question okay what if what if we try this what if I do this what if I change the sound what if I change one note what if we shorten the rhythm or you know like we make it expand or what if we permutate the uh, uh, the notes and stuff like that yeah, yeah. Did you did you have sort of like um, for me the interesting thing with with discovering King Crimson was that before I heard King Crimson I already knew the music of King Crimson. This is this is like when I first heard it for me it was it was uh, it was um, discovering the music outside of myself that I had inside. Well, that's was, yeah, which was super and super interesting. So I already had this sort of like this dream that you could say, you know, I had this imagination for that music um, to exist. And then like the first album that I heard was this actually. So uh, later, later version of the band, but um, you know, like the, yeah, what I, you know, what I was going to say or what, what I wanted to ask you is um but maybe even like from your from a perspective of today, would you say that you have sort of like a very specific vision or a very specific sense for what is right and what is wrong, um, for lack of a better term, or or how do you how do you decide on what the world you create should be? I mean, I I think I do similar things that you do. I I you know I try things out based on ideas. So like I'm sitting in the train thinking, oh, I could try to do this and combine that with that and just see what happens. And then um, and I, I set this up and then I, that's, that's the, the cognitive you know, level, which where I just uh, think about things, what would I could do? Just um, you know, a lot about permutations, doing this and, and then changing that and just uh, mm -hmm. trying things out. But then the next step is completely intuitive. It's like, no, this is not. This is not good. I can mm -hmm. I can give this up right now. I don't have to waste any more time. Other mm -hmm. things I know I know at once. This is interesting. I'm I'm, I'm going to go down this path because this is really something that's worth um, worth doing. So I have a you know this this mixture of cognitive and intuitive things. It uh, usually starts with the cognitive world and then mm -hmm. goes into an intuitive world. And like when I'm when I'm working, it's always I know exactly how something should sound, and I, I know it's it's just a feeling that I have. You know, if you if you turn if you turn levels of something, you know, this is the right level. I mean, other people would say it's not, but for me, I know this is the right level. It's just it just feels right. It just feels like that's the thing I want to do. That's how it should sound. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I, this... I have, yeah, I have that today a lot. That I just. It's it's a mixture of these two different processes. Yeah, it's it is the, it is it is very very similar to me. Yes, I agree. And and but the the fact that you have this opinion, let's say, so that your that your mind is opinionated about what it's hearing, or you know, or like like you say, like a musical structure, or or even in a mix, like the levels. Uh, I think that is that is really a gift in a way to have that have that. Um, um, have that, to have that confidence, right? To just say this it's is the way. It's a lot about confidence, right? It's a lot about confidence. It's just having, you know, knowing, knowing you want to find something, and no matter how much time you need, you you're just going to do it, and you, mm -hmm. you go down that path, and you don't give up, and you um, just until you find it. That's that has a lot to do with confidence, I think. Yeah. So so, oh, you go ahead if you. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people ask, you know, how do you, how do you compose? How do you, how do you get these ideas? And it's just, for me, it's, it's, I mean, first of all, like I said, it's the cognitive part. It's like, okay, what, what would happen if I take a, a seven, four, a five, four, and a nine, four, and put them all together, and this instrument will play a five, this instrument will play a nine. I just, it's just an idea. And, and it could be a stupid math exercise. But it could also sound good, and and I f I immediately find out if it fa if it's good in any way, or maybe I have to change something until it sounds good, and then you just have to keep pushing until you find something interesting, 
Yeah. So it's it's not a mystical process. It's just uh, it's thinking about things, you know, and and also learning. I mean, every time I'm, you know, I, I can't think of anything anymore. I, I read a book. I try to learn something new. So I get new ideas what I could try, and then I try them out. And then it's just um, it's just hard work and and uh, going down a path to find something that you're looking for. Yeah. Sounds, sounds very familiar. <laughs> yeah, I, I, would, I would have suspected, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, just because there is not much information about this out there, but then, like, um, you, you finished your studies and you went to uh, become a teacher right after, I guess, right? Or was there anything? I wrote a PhD first and then after that became a teacher, yeah. Okay, okay. And music, music was always at that point already, like always happening on the side, right? Yeah. There was always some kind of band going on. So yeah. Yeah. And then like the first band of yours that I heard about was uh, Radio Osaka, which um, uh, Udo, my friend Udo, uh, had had an album. And, uh, and when so, so maybe, but maybe I, I should ask differently. So what was like then the, like the first um, band you, that you were in that was kind of like significant in your life as a musician, you would say? Was that even before Radio Osaka? Uh, before that, I had a few bands. I mean, there was a band which I really actually liked a lot, but that again was, I mean, it was a band that I put together after I heard um, David Torn's album, Cloud About Mercury. Mm -hmm. That was also an album which really blew my mind. And I had a friend at the time, he, he also loved that album. He was also a guitarist and um, he, he convinced me to start a band with, um, that, you know, with a trumpet player and a, a drummer that played, you know, tuned percussion it was really i mean it was it, it's, it's it's it was very similar to what david did on that album mm -hmm. but it's still an album that i like to listen to it's it's uh, it's the compositions are not bad and it's well played and it's it's a band i enjoyed being in but that was not very long lived mm -hmm. and um let me see yeah afterwards it was radio was a call, yeah. right. that went on for a long time mm -hmm. And we did a lot of stuff, some very interesting, some I can't listen to anymore. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but, it, but it was an interesting band in any case. It was good musicians. Usually we had jazz musicians playing with us and um, they were technically very good. And uh, it was an interesting combination. Sadly, the, the singer died a few weeks ago. Oh. The singer of the band, he, was, he had cancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of sad. Sorry. And um, that went through throughout the 90s and late also in the 2000s or? Into the 2000s, right. Okay. Yeah, actually until about 2010. And oh, okay. uh, it was, a, yeah, it was, a, we, we, did, uh, we did a lot of albums and um, there was, um, I mean, what, what eventually changed, what eventually led me to, to start Sonar was um, that there were a lot of people in the audience who came to me after the gig and said, oh, I love your music and I love your compositions, but I, I don't really like the singer. You know, I don't like his voice. And um, you know, I heard that so many times that, that I started thinking myself, maybe I should do something instrumental just, you know, for, uh, for, for, uh, just to try it out. And but then my next thought was, OK, if I do something, it, it has to be radical in a certain way. I don't I don't want just another band playing, you know, stuff and, and even if it's interesting stuff. But I wanted to be radical in a certain way. And I was at that time I was um, I was playing with Bernard to a lot. And we um, I remember that I once used a tuning for for one piece that I, I wanted to play one piece. In, uh, but it was so hard to play in the standard tuning, or at that time I, I wasn't using I wasn't using the standard tuning. I would I used um, the new standard tuning, Fripp's mm -hmm. Guitarcraft tuning, 
Mm -hmm. I used that since 1993 or so. Mm -hmm. So Radio Osaka was all a new standard to me. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I, I wanted to play a piece, but it was impossible to play in that tuning. So I tuned the guitar to tritones, and then it, then I could uh, then I could play it. And that was, but that was just for one piece. And I mm -hmm. never thought that that would be a tuning that I could use all the time. Mm -hmm. But then, when I was thinking about a new band, I thought, well, maybe maybe if I wanted to be radical, maybe I could just you know tune the guitars to tritones, and see what happens. So I did that, and um, I really loved the harmonics, the natural harmonics of that tuning, and it, you know, it created a world of its own, so to, so to speak. So I thought, okay, that's that could be a starting point. So Bernard and I, we we played a bit in that tuning, and um, found some things out and uh, exchanged ideas, and then. Um, we also thought about it was it was the time where where um, we we also listened to a lot of Nick Berch's music mm -hmm. around 2010, and Nick was playing a lot in Zurich, so we, we we often met at his concerts and so and and this type of minimal music also really interested. I mean, it interested me before as well, but not so as a concept for a band to be really mm -hmm. a, a minimalist approach. So that also came into the game. And um, also other things like in Radio Osaka, I had oh, I was so headache making. I had a, a setup you wouldn't believe. I mean, it, it would, I had a, a mix 24 channel mixing desk on the stage. I had synthesizers, sequencers, guitar pedals, so much stuff, so much crazy stuff. And all the time while playing, I was always thinking, okay, now I have to do this. Now I have to press this. Now I have to press this. Now I have to play this. Now I have to press. And it was like getting so, ridiculous i really thought no i want to i want to band where i don't have to think about this stuff you know mm -hmm. just a guitar an amp and maybe a reverb pedal but that's all so that was another aspect of sonar that we thought okay let's try something very uh, completely without effects so um yeah we did that and um yeah that came out really nicely and a lot of people liked it and um, um sort of grew and um, we had uh, we had good feedback from a lot of people. We got a record deal first with um, with Ronin, with the Nick's label, then with Cuneiform and later with Rare Noise. So we've, we've had really, we've been lucky. We've had yes. good support. Yeah, it seems, it seems uh, um, a little bit like um, you, you kind of like worked your way up to the situation where sona then sort of like happened in a yeah. way and and it was like the moment of where you were freeing yourself of as you said like of the of the gear of the weight somehow of the past and uh, and con you con started concentrating on that uh, particular language that was then also even like filtered through the tuning and uh, and everything. So with Sonar, are you still uh, using the, the Triton tuning for, for everything with the band? Yep. I mean, basically, my guitar is tuned in Tritones. Sometimes, you know, for fractal guitar, I, I retuned it maybe just according to what, what I wanted to play. But I usually use the Triton tuning. Mm -hmm. It's it's a great tuning because you can do a lot of things you can't do on a normal guitar. It's really hard to improvise in. Like if you, you know, just uh, a basic uh, minor scale is really <laughs> hard to play on, on the, in the tritone tuning. Mm -hmm. but, uh, so maybe if I if I have to play a, or want to or have to play a solo, I will I will retune to the stand, new standard tuning maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise, to, you know, just to play parts and um, it's it's great for chords with tritone tuning. Mm -hmm. You can play. Well, I'll show you. If you, I mean, because you have this, you hear that? This is just the, the sound. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, it's wrong. This is wrong too. But you can, you can play a chord where you have six seeds. You know, if I play, oh, yeah. if I play it like this and just, it's it's detuned now, but so it won't mm -hmm. work. 
you can mm -hmm. play C's and it's a really powerful chord. I mean, it's, it's not a chord, it's just one, one note actually. Yeah, yeah. But then you can, you can play every, if you, if you move around on the, on, the, on the fretboard, you can play like here you would have three E flats and then against three C's. Yeah. So, you, so you can really have these interesting chords that you can play in the, in the triton tuning. So I do that a lot too. Yeah, because of the the open the open strings and yeah. uh, interesting, and you can strings, yeah. and you can also play the F sharps on the other strings and right. get the, the yeah yeah yeah, right. yeah that's that's very cool. Um, you know, like music, um, and you know, I'm I'm also well, I say also, but like this this idea of drone based music is very. Uh, it's very dear to me, not just, you know, I also write music that is not drum based, but um, as like a, a tool for, for musical education, for educating myself, not just for others, but you know, for myself, um, the idea of music, music equals relationship, you could say, like it's like, like relationship of two notes or of two sounds, that's where musicality kind of comes into play and, and, uh, that's why open tunings in general are sort of like very interesting for for exploring the um, the relationships of sound because you have the resonance of the instrument is kind of building this this field right in which you can then sort of like move the other nodes around and you learn about the relationships. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and the interesting thing for me is also that you know interval. I, I mean, in that sense, it's all about intervals, isn't it? And mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. But intervals can can sound very different depending on the context. Yes. I mean, you can have you can have an interval that if you just play it, it sounds completely dissonant. But if in a certain context, it will sound consonant. Yes. And also depending on the instrument or the orchestration, how how you play it. That's that's I find find that a very interesting how. To yes, exactly, exactly. And that is sort of like the second level interval, right? You have like two. You have one interval. You have two intervals, and then like the way that some people say usually think about it is they collapse all the notes into one octave but really if we want to be like more precise in describing what's happening you also need to specify which range of the spectrum is the note and and then obviously like like maybe the most one of the most common examples on a, a guitar chord would be the uh, a minor chord with with a B in it, right? You have the B natural and the C clashing, right? But you have the low A underneath and that's why it sounds beautiful. And otherwise it would sound, you know? And yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 that that kind of like is the beauty of music that you have this, in a way, a little bit of an, uh, of a, um, it's, it's a little bit like, I don't, I mean, I, I'm just gonna say it, architecture. It's a little bit like architecture because like a building, you, you kind of like build, a building into a landscape right yeah. so 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 and in a way it's it's with pitches and with rhythms you kind of place them into a into an existing framework which is how the frequencies interact and uh etc yeah. yeah that's that what sonar stands for sonic architecture ah uh -huh, really <laughs> i didn't know yes but fantastic fantastic that makes total sense so um, at which point then did you kind of like, well, and you, you already said that you kind of like, it was relatively late for you to kind of like really understand that composing is what you, what you stand for, let's say, right. composition. And, um, and, and so uh, there, there is also a project that we're both involved in that is um, like from Mallet Quartet, that where we've both contributed pieces and uh, and the, the string quartets that were that you composed and that were recorded. And so so when did that part of composition for other people kind of come into your life? Um, that started in early 2000 when um, I there was another teacher at the school uh, when I where I was teaching and she she was a pianist and she asked me if I could write something for her. Mm -hmm. And um, that was my first comp like composition for other people, and that was a piano piece in, in three movements, and I really enjoyed doing that. So I got you know got interested in, in the concept of composing for others, and 
then I remember that was also for me very important. I, I bought some software. I bought this Vienna Instruments software for strings and it sounded good. You know, you could really, you could sit at home at the keyboard and it would sound like a real string quartet. And I, I really love that. And, and it spi inspired me to, to write things. And um, in 2006 is when I wrote my first string quartet. That mm -hmm. was that's on my string quartet album. But it's played by the Alpari Quartet from, from, um, from Poland because, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'll just repeat the story. It's on, it's on the cover of the album, but it's an interesting story because um, actually you were there too, I think, um, in 2014. We met in Zurich, you remember? Mm -hmm. Anil mm -hmm. was there, you were there, yeah. a lot of people were there. And Anil was at my flat and I said, do you have a minute? I, I'd like to show you my, my string quartet. And I had this computer recording with Vienna instruments. It sounded pretty good. I mean, of course you could tell it's not a real string quartet, but it sounded pretty good. And he listened to that and said, hey man, that's so cool. You have to, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing David Harrington next, next week or in two weeks and uh, I'll, I'll play it for him. And it was funny because actually I had sent that quartet to Kronos, like in 2007 or so. I thought, I just, you know, I'll send it to them, see what they see. But as I know now, Kronos gets like hundreds of demo tapes daily. I mean, it's, yeah. it's incredible. They have a, a storage room full of cassette tapes and stuff. So they have so many things that they can't possibly listen to. I mean, it's mm -hmm. obviously. Mm -hmm. But then I was lucky to have Anil and Anil went to David and played him that and David liked it. And then he wrote me an email saying uh, he really liked the piece. But then I heard nothing from David again. I sent him the, I sent him the score and I didn't hear anything. And then I wrote to him, but didn't get an answer. So I, you know, I was kind of sad, but Anil said, oh, you wait, you have to wait to the right moment. <laughs> <laughs> Anil wrote me one day, had said, okay, um, Kronos have finished this cycle. Maybe now's the right time to ask him again. So I wrote an email to David and say, hey, David, how are you? Um, you think we could meet about my string quartet and so on? And then he responded and very friendly and very nice and said, yeah, um, let's meet in, in San Francisco. And um, I went there. I was going there anyway. So it was... Um, a good combination there at that time and then we met and then he told me um yeah they were doing this 50 for the future project and actually he likes the piece very much that i wrote but he would like to me to write me he would might like me to write something new for them they they always want people to write stuff for them explicitly mm -hmm. so um I, I asked him what he would like and he said well the thing he liked about my first quartet is that it goes through all keys. Like it starts in G minor, I think, and then it goes in fourths down mm -hmm. the whole the whole circle until it goes back to G. He liked that because um, for a string quartet, it's very difficult, like playing in, in E flat minor. It's, it's just much more difficult than playing in, in C major or so. Mm -hmm. So um, that would be a good exercise for a string quartet. And that's what 50 for the Future is about, you know, finding a good repertoire for that's very broad and, and, mm -hmm. and addresses all the, the difficulties a string quartet can face. So um, he said he'd like that if, if it would like be, be a piece in all keys, if mm -hmm. possible. So, so I did that, I wrote that piece and um, yeah, it was, uh, it, was really, uh, it was played live a year later and then they recorded it. So that was the basis for my string quartet album, that piece, that recording of that piece. They, they allowed me to use it for the record. And um, for the other pieces, I, I asked the, the Alpari Quartet from Poland to play. And they are really wonderful, wonderful. Four young women who were really so dedicated and so good. It was a very enjoyable experience recording with them. Fantastic. You know, like I was, as you said, I was there when uh, we all met up in Zurich and, uh, right. and I also stayed at your apartment. Right. Right. And, and I remember that you also played me the, the string oh, quartet. Then. I didn't remember that. Yeah. Yes, you did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. You see, like, so this is, this is how things, things go, right? It's, 
um, like patience, you know, is also um, at least at least in my career is a big part. Yeah. It really is a big part. And sometimes I can get a little bit impatient um, when there is like a long period of time where nothing seems to be happening. And um, I remember that for me, the time in the like the early 2000s, it was kind of like almost unbearable. That was like from from 2000 to 2005 or even 2007. There was so little going on, and then suddenly there were like these these little droplets of okay, an opportunity here and there, and um, I'm I'm really really happy to see how that how you know things have come together for you and that you that you can now with confidence say okay I'm a composer and and, and I do I have I, and not if there's not only the rock band in which I perform but there's also like this music that I write for other ensembles that is that's wonderful and um, so uh, I just remembered these these shows we played together with Stickman and Sonar in. Uh, Oh, right. In, yeah. in, in, in Canada. Canada. Right. Canada. Yeah, Canada. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think it was, I think it was, how many shows were like two or three, maybe? Three at least. Uh, it was uh, Montreal, um, Ottawa, and Toronto, I think. Okay. It was one show that, that you didn't, we didn't play. It was, uh, I don't remember where, but there was one show that wasn't, wasn't really uh, convenient for us to play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it was three. You played four, and we played three. three yes. Yeah. yeah, that was that was also a really really nice experience. And but un unfortunately, uh, well, unfortunately, I have not seen you guys play with uh, with David with David Torn. So um, maybe just fill people in how the association with with David Torn happened for Sonar, and and then maybe also. Um, you know, like I, I about fractal guitar. I, I know, I know a lot. Let's say, but, uh, but how did everything kind of like funnel from the experience with of, with sonar into fractal guitar, and with with torn as? Uh, um, well, again, again, it's it's Anil's fault. <laughs> <laughs> he, I, I don't think he likes to hear me say that because. Afterwards, all the people, you know, ask him, can you do that for me too? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or uh, I don't want to be a burden for Anil, but he, I mean, he really helped me so much. And he, he introduced me to a lot of people. One of them was Henry Kaiser, mm -hmm. wonderful guy, which I met in Santa Cruz where he lives. He has a huge house, beautiful house. And um, we met there and um, yeah, we were like talking and H Henry liked Sonar. So we talked a little bit about music and then I asked, that was the time just before, just after Blacklight, the, the last album we did without David. Mm -hmm. And I asked Henry, Henry, who, if you were to tell me a, pro a producer for, for Sonar, who, who would you suggest? And he immediately said, David Torn. Mm -hmm. And of course, I knew David, like I said before, Cloud About Mercury was a really important album for me. And uh, I love David's music. So obviously, that was somebody I have thought about too, but I didn't know of David. So I, I felt, you know, I would, would have felt kind of funny just writing to David and just asking him. But because Henry knew David very well and um, liked Sonar, he wrote David an email. He said, uh, there's this band from Switzerland. I think you'd like the, their music and they, they're looking for a producer. Mm -hmm. And David then wrote to me saying, yeah, sure, let's talk. And we, 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 um, we arranged a telephone meeting and we talked like for two hours. It was, I mean, if you know David, you know, he's so funny and so amusing to talk to. And it was really, I mean, I felt so, so good talking to him. And um, he was like, sure, I'll come to Switzerland and um, I'll bring my, my, my studio technician with me and uh, I'll bring my guitar as well if you want to. No, what, no actually, I, I asked him to bring this guitar. I said, maybe, maybe you could play on one piece or two. Or... Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, so we talked about the pieces and the music and I sent him some, some ideas. And um, then he came he came to, we met in Switzerland and um, 
we I remember we played the first piece as a quartet, you know, without David. He was just in the control room, like he was the producer, right? He was he was in the control room listening, and um, uh, we played this piece once, and it was okay. It was a good good take, and then we said, "Come on, David, let's let's make let's do a take with you." Like the same piece, he heard it once or twice, maybe never before heard the piece, and then uh, I said, "Come on, let's pl play with us." So he came into the recording room, he played with us. And I mean, you really had to be there. Anil was there too, again, Anil. He <laughs> said, I mean, the difference between how we played as a quartet and with David, especially especially for Manuel, the drummer, and for Christian, the bass player, these guys was they exploded as soon as David started playing with them. Because that's that's the kind of thing that David does. He, he mobilizes the energy in yeah. the room mm -hmm. and it was, we were all standing there and couldn't believe what we heard. It was so so great what 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 David was doing and how he changed the play we the, the way we played. That was that was phenomenal. And <laughs> then after that piece, Anil took me aside and said, "Hey, you have to have David play on every track on this, this record." <laughs> so, so I went to David and said, "David, you think you could consider?" playing on every track like you did on that one. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, that's difficult because, you know, I'm in producer mode now. And if I'm in producer mode, I don't think about the guitar that much. And uh, so he had, he really had to think about it if he, if he could do that. But charming as we are, we convinced him to do so. So um, <laughs> and again, he played on every track and it was really, it was so much fun. It was so, it was funny all the time and it was creative and uh, uh, that was really a very special few days wonderful yeah you know i when uh, when i heard you play again after you had the experience with david but you were playing without david i think yeah. sonar had really changed like also right. the quartet um was sounding very different and had a very different energy and uh, um, well the, the thing in Sonar is funny because if you listen to the albums, you won't probably wouldn't guess that we can be really heavy live. Mm -hmm. But that's because um, that's because of Christian and Manuel, because mm -hmm. they are such they 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 can if, if you put them in the studio, they'll, they'll play well, but they won't play with this live energy that they can have. If, mm -hmm. if as soon as you have 200 people really cheering you on, they will play so much you know, uh, harder and better and more creative and, and with more energy. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's the thing we loved about those concerts with Stickman too, where that it was a good audience, a supportive audience and uh, good sound. So for us, it was also really, really a good experience. Yeah, you know, like when, when we recorded um, uh, my album, Falling for Ascension, that was also kind of like the... Um, Having having met you and uh, just hearing what you guys were doing with Sona was sort of like um, it was really like I remembered that I had this piece that mm -hmm. I always always wanted to kind of like yeah. find a form for, and then I said, okay, I need these guys, and uh, um, and I'm I'm still very very happy with that album. I think it really yeah. it, I it just really did a few few months ago as well. It was really I I enjoyed listening to it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I heard things that I didn't hear the first time I listened to it. So um, it, and that's really there's there's a lot there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. Yeah. <laughs> wouldn't maybe hear on the first listen. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. And um, so uh, I'm really hoping that this recording project that we're involved in with the Malik Quartets with the Mannheimer Schlagwerk, that that's that that's going to happen um, this summer. I think it will. Yeah. yeah, it was postponed twice already. So yeah, I know. Yeah, but that's yeah, that's there's good. a lot going on this this summer. This I also have um, a recording for. I, I wrote two two more string quartets and two piano quart piano quintets. Mm -hmm. That that was hard for me to write a piano quintet because I'm not so you know not so uh, used to composing for piano. Mm -hmm. Those two, uh, those two pieces will be recorded as well. Mm -hmm. And there's a very interesting album with um, 
Hans Peter Schwab, uh, Jan Peter Schwab, sorry, um, mm. which you, your album is coming out now, isn't it? Coming out in July, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. looking forward to that. And with, with Ivan Darsen also playing, which um, he is such a wonderful guy and a wonderful musician. And I'm really, really interested how that project is going to turn out. Um, can I ask you what you so so you you're developed because I saw that uh, Manuel uh, played some right. drums. Is that for that project? That's for that project. Okay. Okay. Great. So Manuel, so it. Yeah. Do you have to do, yes. Right. You, have a, you have a you have a bass player also, right? Yeah, Tim Harris from Tim Harris. who played with you know who plays everywhere, but he played with Bruford in Bruford's mm -hmm. band, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, Jan Peter and um, Ivan. And what is what is the um, the uh, process? So, are you delivering drum drum and guitar tracks uh, to Peter, or how does this work? <laughs> it was, it's, inter it's interesting how it works, and, and mm -hmm. we're not finished yet, so I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, but it started like I I sent Peter a lot of tracks. Like I was just you know uh, uh, trying things out, send him some tracks. I think I sent him nine pieces mm -hmm. and he didn't do a lot in the beginning because he was working on your record, for instance. So he was doing other projects. He didn't have a, a lot of time. So it was in the beginning it was mainly me providing pieces, but now he's really started to provide his own pieces. Like he's sending me stuff. Okay. And um, um, so in the studio with Manuel, we just, um, we had about, 10 or 11 pieces that we um, where we recorded drums for. And we, we might record more drums in the future, so it's not finished yet. Oh, and cool. I really can't, I mean, everything's been interesting, but I can't say much about the final product because we agreed that, that Jan Peter will, will, will mix it. And he, of course, has his own special way of mixing. So I don't, I don't really know exactly what he's gonna do in the end, mm -hmm. but I'm sure it's gonna be good because I love his work. Yeah, no, no doubt about that. I, like, it, I'm just so curious because I think it's gonna. You, you are providing him with material that he's really not so used to work with, right. you know. And I, I find that fascinating. Well, he's he's very good with rhythms. I mean, he's not uh, so uh, polyrhythm is nothing special for him. It's just you know, he does a lot of uh, crazy rhythmic stuff too. So that's not um, that's not it wasn't really a problem. Yeah. And um, I think I think uh, the, the very first piece that I sent him, he did he said such an amazing um, synthesizer, you know, adding synthesizers in in places and taking things away that I did. It was really like it was it was a beautiful combination of his world and and my world. Mm -hmm. So, but that was the first piece. So I it's it's still evolving, and I can't say yet where it's going to. But yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I can't. I can't wait for it. And so, like you said, a lot is going on for you. And uh, it, um, you know, you are you are back to work as normal, but with masks, but still more or less normal. And that's a great thing. And I really hope that things are going to change for me here as well, uh, pretty soon. And um, yeah, that's. I'm. I'm curious what the future will bring. And. Uh, um, Stefan, it was fantastic to talk to you again, and I think we, 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 I hope we could also kind of like bring, you shed some light on parts of, of your history that people don't know much about, and uh, yeah. Yeah, we should talk more often, yeah. I, I, I think we definitely should, and uh, well, obviously we're, we're working on Fractal Guitar 3 now, so... <laughs> And, yeah, and I talk about that a lot too. Yeah. Yes, but it's it's cool because um, like I have a, uh, some new equipment, and so these okay. sounds that I use for what I sent you uh, is already like with the it's a little bit of a new sound world, and I'm gonna yeah. dive more into that. And okay. yeah. yeah. What is okay. it? Okay. Can I ask what it is? Last question. Uh, yeah, it's the it's the uh, quad cortex. This um, it's it's. It's neural DSP. It's so basically, it's something like the Helix or the Camper, but it has um, just like the Camper. You can you can take uh, you can um, connect uh, 
several pedals and then you can capture the sound of the pedals into one block on the and for me it's it's great because then i can have like a really complex sound in just one right. block in a in a big uh, matrix of possibilities yeah. and and that way because like i i love i love really complex sounds that have a lot of interaction in them and with with a lot of filtering and and uh you control and it, that pedal right the filtering things um either with a pedal or um in the case of what i think what you're referring to it it was uh it was like a touch uh sensitive thing oh great yeah so with an envelope follower you know okay. so and 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 that um it's oh I'm, I'm always interested in finding these these new sounds i mean especially um yeah man, we haven't talked about fractal guitar much but really fractal guitar for me is sort of like or i don't know from from the outside perspective it's like stefan the composer who's doing sonar and he i guess you have developed this language uh, where sort of um in the beginning at least uh the idea of like the minimal sound just the clean guitars and like just precisely those four parts to guitars bass drums that was uh, important but now with with uh, fractal guitar it's more like you have um, kind of like a similar outline but then everything is filled in with these different colors and characters of uh, the musicians right yeah i mean that was a conscience conscious choice because um you know when i played with sonar without effects for a few years i started missing effects so <laughs> <laughs> so i had to go back to that one. yes yeah okay it's, my friend yeah. good thing good thing in life to uh to miss things because then when you come back to it you really want it you know it's it's i think it's a good discipline to you know just stop doing things for a while because you then can start again with new energy exactly and it, it's a little bit like um like as you're saying you will maybe you start composing uh with as you say like with a uh, with a mental like a cerebral kind of idea purely in your head and then it comes out and it becomes real and then you start uh working intuitively and with uh, uh so so when you when you're kind of imposing certain uh restrictions on on the idea level on the you know then then it creates like new results and right. it's it's like it's like um it's like trying to find a mathematical proof but you're not allowed to use addition or something <laughs> like that right That's good stuff, yeah. <laughs> yes. i know what you mean yeah. yes yes <laughs> okay. okay nice talking to you thank you marcus yeah real pleasure and um, yeah, i'll see you again soon i hope okay. Bye-bye for now, Stefan. Bye-bye.